getting ready for worship service on this morning. I'm reading James, if you please stand. James chapter 1. I'm reading in the New Living Translation, verses 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is sealed, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. For this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you that we woke up, O oh God, in your mercy and grace and not in judgment. We thank you that we have the activities of our limbs and that our minds are alert, ready to worship and to praise you. Bless those that are on their way. Bless the preach word. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that will continue to lead us and guide us in this service. And we give you the glory and all honor. And all those who have come out to worship the Lord and agree with this prayer, let's say amen, 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 amen. and amen. As you continue to clap your hands, let us amen. Bless the Lord in this place. Come on. Give him a thunderous round of applause. All right. Amen.
How many come to praise him this morning? How many know he's worthy? He's worthy. I said, how many know he's worthy? Yeah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Be glorified in this place, we pray. Amen. Amen. This song just simply says, for your glory. More than anything, we need the glory of God. The Bible declares that in his presence is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father, we need. Sister Karen is coming.
Come on, everybody, alto in the house. Gotta be where you are. Come on, everybody, sing it, sing it. Wanna be where you are. I gotta be where you are. Turn it, let me hear you. Turn it, let me hear you. Wanna be where you are. Gotta be. Gotta be where. got to be where you are, in your presence, there's fullness of joy, at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore, and in his presence, we can bring him all of our heartaches, all of our disappointments, all of our burdens, and all of our praise. It's prayer time. And in the midst of prayer, we're already in his presence. Just grab the person's hand by you. If you want to kneel, if you want to stand, we're going to praise him. Gotta be where you are. 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 Gotta be where. There's deliverance in this room. There's healing in this room. Some of us got some illnesses that we haven't even told anyone. But the Lord says, I'm here to heal you. If you just reach up and receive it, I'll heal you and touch you right where you are. Huh? Cancer has to go. 
Diabetes has to go. Depression has to go. Anxieties has to go. Because we're in his presence. God, touch us right now. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your mercies. We thank you because you are Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Shalom. Somebody needs peace today, God. In the midst of their confusion, they're saying, God, you said you will keep us in perfect peace if we keep our minds on you. So we thank you for Jehovah Shalom. We thank you for being our banner. We thank you, oh God, that in your presence, we can leave all of our burdens and troubles. Now I'm continuing to move up and down these aisles. Oh God, touch the person that I'm holding their hand. You know what they're in need of, I don't. But God, we say come to their rescue. Speak to their heart and lift up their spirit. We thank you, oh God, that you did everything at Calvary. Oh God, at the cross. We thank you that you continue to live and you live in us. Now bless the word that shall come forth, unhindered and unchecked by any forces of Satan. God, that it will not return unto you void without accomplishing what you sent it to do. So we thank you that we are ready, people, that receive your word. Let it be hidden in our hearts that we will not sin against you. Forgive us of our sins, for they are many. And God, as we continue in this service, we continue to say, God, we want to be where you are. We want to be where you are, oh God. And we thank you for your presence. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. All of the believers say amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. Greet the person that's next to you. Amen, amen, and amen. We are yet in the presence of the Lord. And as we're taking our seats and waving to one another, let's just wave. Amen. Amen. At this time, we would like to recognize and acknowledge any and all of our first-time visitors. If you are a first-time visitor, we would ask that you would please stand at this time so that we can recognize you. Amen. We do want to acknowledge all of our live stream. Those that have been live streaming with us, as you can tell, I'm still full. <laughs> we do want to thank you for tuning in into the presence of the Lord on this morning. Amen. Amen. We come to worship him and we come to glorify him. Amen. Because I don't want any rocks crying out for me. Amen. I want to give him all the glory and all the honor. Amen. We're going to continue to worship with our music ministry under the leadership of our music ministry leader, Miss Karen Daniels. I'm out of breath, y'all. Give the Lord a hand praise. Amen.
Thank you.
back in wonder and when my soul looks back in wonder at how I got over all I can say is thank you anybody got a praise this morning for how you got over it could have been a whole lot worse had the devil had his way we wouldn't be where we are today but my soul looks back, not only in wonder, but in wonder at how I got over. I bless the Lord in this house today. I praise him for his goodness. He is worthy to be praised. And I'm so glad that the spirit of God in Christ is in this house. And somebody here today came to worship him. Amen. Amen. We didn't come to be seen. We came to see him and to worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm so grateful to be here today. It's so good to see all of you who are here. Thank God for our music department, our AV team, our ushers, and all those who are laboring to set the atmosphere for worship and to make it conducive for the purpose for which you and I have gathered. Amen. We didn't gather for any other reason than to bless God, to hear from God, and to worship him in spirit and in truth. And uh, I am privileged for all those who are live streaming. We thank God for you as well. And it's just good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Has anybody had a trying week this week? Amen. I'm the only one? Okay. Well, I'm, I just want you to know it's been a trying week, but it's been a good week. And I'm just glad that despite the, tri the trials and the troubles that we've had to experience, God has given us the ability to prevail over them all. Amen. And so I am grateful and just glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Daryl Coley said, when Sunday comes. Amen. Anybody ever just look forward to Sunday? Amen. When you, when you can lay aside all that other mess you've had to go through, and when Sunday comes, when I can just focus my attention and my heart on him who is above. Amen. I ain't got to worry about no bills. I ain't got to worry about no argument. I mean, when, when Sunday comes, I gather in the house of the saints and all of that other stuff. I can take off my mind and my heart for at least a moment or two so I can regroup and revive. Amen. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the privilege of being able to gather in this your house one more time. We confess, God, our unworthiness, but we express our gratitude for all of the multiple blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, God, for the privilege of being able to gather one more time as we worship you and as we attempt to hear from you. Speak now, Lord. Let your word go forth and not return unto you void. But may it accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. I confess, God, I can't do anything good without you, but with you, God, I believe I'm able to do all things because you do all things well. Also pray, God, that you will speak into the hearts of those who were here. Open up every mind, every heart, and help us to clearly comprehend what is being conveyed today. And let it not be something we just say is possibly good, but something that will carry us throughout life. Engrave your word in our minds and our hearts until your word become a living reality in our lives. Thank you, God, for all things. We say glory. We say praise. We say hallelujah for all of your goodness, for your Christ and your spirit. Receive our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we continue our theme for the year, that is living by faith. We want to look at our series that we started on about three weeks ago, and that is how to overcome generational curses. I'm a firm believer that too many of us as believers are allowing ourselves 
to live beneath our potential as those who are in Christ. And I've learned as a pastor over the years that a lot of Christians, true born-again Christians, have a tendency to genuinely believe and agree to the word, but not practice it. We have a tendency to give our consent to it, but not necessarily our commitment to it. And so I want us to go to Genesis, the 12th chapter again. I said on last week we would talk about the blessings of Abraham. We'll probably be in this passage for at least two or three weeks, Lord willing. Now the Lord said to Abram, or let me read that again. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make or create, make you a great nation. I will bless, I will benefit, I will favor and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old, when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. I wanna talk about the blessings of Abraham. The blessings of Abraham. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. The blessings of Abraham. The 12th chapter of Genesis is one of the most important and significant passages of scripture ever recorded within the 66 books of the Bible in which you and I read. I say that because this text becomes the turning point for a lost humanity whose hearts had become severely separated from the God who had created and made them in his image and after his likeness, the practice of sin, and the rejection of a holy God had permeated across the world and was passed down generationally to all of humanity from the sin and the seed of Adam and Eve. The killing of Abel by his brother Cain and the wickedness of those in the day of Noah was evidence that sin had so evolved into a state of depravity that mankind appeared to be unredeemable and without hope. But then the Bible says in verse one, the A clause, then the Lord had said to Abram, for 422 years, my brothers and sisters, there was no recorded communication between God and man. And imagine living in a world with your family from generation to generation for at least four generations and nobody heard a word from God. There were no church services like we have today. There was nobody praying to the only true and living God. For 422 years, there's no recorded communication with God speaking to man. Bible tells us then all of a sudden just out of the blue the Bible says the Lord has spoken 
are said to Abram. Can I help somebody this morning? 422 years had passed since God has spoken to Noah and all of his descendants. Evidently, Noah was a righteous man who eventually got drunk and cursed his son. Noah, a righteous man, became fatigued and became tired and became weary and found himself in a vineyard and became drunken as a result. And as certain things transpired in his family, Noah had the audacity to curse his own family. And I stopped by to tell somebody, you got to be careful how you speak to your children. You got to be careful how, what words you use because your words can literally shape the destiny. Your words, when you speak to them, if they're consistently negative, you may not realize it, but you're consistently forming and fashioning a mindset that will grow up to be negative, to be belittled, to see themselves as inferior, to see themselves as worthless. And I don't care how frustrated and angry you get, you got to be careful what you say. You've heard me say it before that somebody came up with the cliche that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I stop by to tell you that's a lie. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but your bones can be repaired. But there are some words that come out of our mouth that if those persons don't get connected to Christ and the surgeon of life, those words can not only keep them in a hopeless state, but those words can literally kill them. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can destroy the entirety of my life. Because once those words take seed and take root, and begin to grow in my mind and begin to grow in my heart, I become what those words suggest I am. And so I want to say to every parent, every grandparent, every friend, every auntie, every uncle, and every person connected to a child, be careful how you pass your words to your children. Noah cursed his own son. I was sharing with someone on yesterday about a guy that uh, I didn't know had already died, but I used to work for him here in the city of Louisville. And he had a nasty attitude. And I remember when I worked for him, he used to cuss his son out all the time. His son was a full grown man. We were both working for him. But he talked to his son in such a negative and ungodly way. And I was sharing with a guy on yesterday when I asked him, I said, have you seen this guy? He said, I think he's dead now. He said, did you know him? I said, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm amazed at how he used to talk to his children. And as a result of talking to his children, they all died in a terrible way. And I stopped by to tell you, you, you got to be careful. I want to reiter reiterate it, how you speak to your children. Because you create generational curses by what you say and by what you do. So for 422 years had passed since God has spoken to Noah, who was a righteous man, and eventually became drunk and cursed his son. His family, immediately after being cursed, becomes divided and dysfunctional, and all of his descendants delve into a state of depravity. And then all of a sudden, somebody say all of a sudden, the Bible says, now the Lord said to Abram, and some of you may have still missed it because Abram was an idol worshiper who was comfortable in a culture of where people practiced paganism, which was normal for them. They were eternally doomed for destruction and damnation. But the first sentence in chapter 12 says that the Lord has said to Abram, you see, the Bible tells us that immediately that tells me one or two things, and that is about God, that first and foremost, the text teaches us that God's blessings upon Abram was not necessarily because of, but first and foremost, in spite of. And I stop by to tell somebody, God doesn't always bless us because of. 
oftentimes God blesses us in spite of. I wish I had two or three folk in the house who were honest enough to be willing to admit that all of the blessings that God has bestowed upon you was not because you were righteous. It was not because you did everything you're supposed to do. It was not because you were necessarily obedient, but God has blessed you in spite of you. Is there anybody in the house that knows that I'm telling the truth when I say that you didn't deserve everything that God has done for you? You haven't, you haven't deserved all of the blessings that have been bestowed upon you and your family. If you look back on some of the things that you've done in the midnight hours, in the darkness of night, if you just think about some of those things, take a, take a retrospective look back over your life and then ask yourself, did I deserve everything that God has done for me? I stop by to tell you the answer is no. Even if you lie to yourself and say, yeah, I told for you. You did not deserve everything God has done. God has been better to you than you deserve. God has been better to me than I deserve. The blessings of Abraham were in spite of his unworthiness. God didn't have to do it. But the Bible says despite the fact that 422 years had passed without anybody being communicated to by God, God had said to Abram. Although the scriptures describe Noah and Abram as a righteous man or righteous men, they were not without their faults and their failures, and nor were they without their sins. Because the Bible clearly conveys that Abram was a liar, and, and, and Noah became a drunkard, and they, and they were not always guilty, if you will, of serving the true and living God. The Bible helps us understand that it suggests that God's desire to bless Abram was not necessarily because of, but in spite of who he was. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that all of my blessings are not contingent upon what I deserve. In fact, I heard one song, I think it was by uh, Bishop Paul Martin, who says, God, whatever you're doing, he says, don't do it without me. And I know what he meant, but I said, God, I don't want to be a part of whatever you're doing, because you might be judging folk for what they've done wrong. So I changed that thing. I said, whatever you're doing, good. Whatever you're doing that's right for, for my benefit, God, don't do it without me, because... Because if I just say, God, whatever you're doing in the community, whatever you're doing in the city, don't do it without me. His wrath might be coming through there. And I just included myself in there. No, no. I don't want to be a part of whatever God is doing. Because God is not only a holy God, he's also a God that is so holy he will judge us. The Bible says the blessings of Abraham were in spite of Abraham's unworthiness. However, it suggests that God's desire to bless Abraham was not because of but in spite of and God's desire to bless us is not because of but in spite of and notice something that it helps us understand first and foremost God blesses us I bless Abram and he blesses us despite our past because if you look at the text and you go back it talks about how where Abram came from and notice that in verse 1 God tells him because of the kind of country and the people he was connected to God tells him he must depart from them in order to be blessed. And so it helps us to understand, as we look at the text, it says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, in other words, get out of your country. So that is a saying that God didn't bless Abram because he was worthy. God blessed him in spite of his past. And every one of us in here and everyone listening by live stream and everyone who will hear us on the radio will have to come to confess we all have a past. You might be able to say, I did, I've never done this, I've never done that, but every one of us, come on, talk to me, somebody. Every one of us have a past. Yes, the Bible declares that the righteous exalts a nation, but sin is a reproof to any people. However, the blessings of God are not necessarily because of, but despite of. In other words, despite our wickedness, despite the constant attitudes, despite the lies, despite the things that we've engaged in, despite our activities, despite all the things we've done, God still blessed us. I don't know about you, but I stand before you today as a living witness. If it was based on my worthiness and based on my goodness, I wouldn't have half the, I, no, hold on, let me back up. I wouldn't have a tenth of the blessings that I have today. And I'm not just talking about material things. I'm talking about the favor of God. 
over my life. I, I wouldn't be saved today if it was based on my goodness. But God has been good to me. And I wonder if anybody can say, but God. Despite my past, despite the things that I've done contrary to his will, but God has been good to me. The blessings of God are not because we deserve them, but despite our unworthiness. God's blessings are not hindered. I'm so glad that this is true. God's blessings are not hindered by our past. I'm reminded of the prodigal son in Luke, the 15th chapter. The Bible said he came to his daddy. It's a type of how we treat God with an arrogant attitude and said, give me all of mine now. And I tell people, you got to be careful what you ask for. Because you're not always ready for what you're wanting. And some of y'all can look back on some of your relationships. You asked God to bless you with somebody, and God said no. And you just kept on bothering him, and he sent you somebody. Amen. And you said, God, take him, and God said no. <laughs> you got to be careful what you ask for. The Bible tells us that we all have a past, but, but notice, if you will, the Bible does not teach us that we're blessed because of our worthiness. It helps us understand God's blessings are not hindered despite our unworthiness. Every biblical character that we read about was just like us. Moses, and he had a past. David had a past. Paul had a past. Peter had a past. But God called them and blessed them despite their past. And the reason I think this is so important, my brothers and sisters, because some of us are procrastinators and feel like we can't do anything that God has called us because of our past. I've talked to people who have literally said to me, I, can't, I know I can't be saved because I've had a past. You are not that bad and you've not done so much evil that God can't save you, that God can't redeem you. I stop by to tell somebody the blood of Christ is thick enough and long enough and it goes generationally far enough to save anybody who is willing to come to the cross and say I'm guilty of sin and I need to be saved. It's not based on your goodness. It's not based on your worth. It's not based on all of your right. It's based on the fact that God has sent a measure of grace and if we just simply learn how to tap in with faith, God's grace by faith will save us. God's blessings are not hindered by our past. If that were the case, none of us would be blessed. But the Bible tells us in Mark 2, 13 through 17, when Jesus was talking and inviting tax collectors and sinners to come, the Pharisees, those righteous religious persons. And, and you know, it's sad, my brothers and sisters, that even in 2019, that, that there's still modern day Pharisees. And I learned, and I've said to to many people that the hardest people to deal with in the house of worship, our church, are people who's been in it the longest. Because some, for some reason, they develop this righteous mentality and they start setting standards that, 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 that they feel that people ought to measure up to when they themselves don't even measure up to them. And then they start looking at people funny if they're not a part of their own circle or their own little clique. And then they start condemning people that are where they used to be. The Bible says this was the Pharisee mentality. And, and as Jesus was calling text collectors and, and sinners, it says the Pharisees began to complain. All these uh, heathens coming up in the church. Well, if it wasn't heathens coming up, nobody would be in here. Amen, Cause, because you ain't never been that holy that you can't say, that you can honestly say you ain't never been a heathen. In fact, I, I would maintain that some of us on our way to heaven are still practicing heathen ways. So, so you know you getting in it by grace. I mean, and I ain't talking about something we did last week. Some of us woke up this morning with a heathenistic mentality. Amen. And yet by grace. So, and the Pharisees have a tendency to condemn people, always looking down on people who are committing sins they may not have necessarily committed themselves. You remember how they brought the young lady in John 8 chapter who was caught in adultery? And they came to Jesus and said this woman was caught 
in the very act of adultery. First of all, it says they were stalkers. How are you going to catch somebody if you ain't stalking them? <laughs> Secondly, say they were caught in the very act, which means you saw the man and the woman uh, sexually engaged. However, they never brought the man, which suggests to me one of them was a Pharisee. <laughs> you know, people don't turn on their own. <laughs> Amen. And, and so they set the woman up and they bring them to her to Jesus and Jesus kneels down and writes on in the dirt and I believe that I don't know what he wrote because the Bible doesn't say but I'm I'm convinced he started writing certain sins and after he began to note certain sins he got up and he says now anyone who has not committed a sin I'm not gonna go against the law yes he's supposed to be stoned but anybody that's not committed a sin you throw the first stone the Bible said one by one they were convicted because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm so glad that God's blessings are not hindered by our past. And in that same text in Mark, the second chapter, Jesus says, I didn't come to call the righteous. And you got to understand that you're not going to get to heaven by your righteous living. You get there by a righteous heart that God gives you through his grace. And then as a result of becoming righteous through Christ, you strive to live a righteous life. But none of us are able to live well enough with our sin nature to please or appease God from the wrath that will come upon us. That's why he sent his son into the world. So it's, the, it's by grace through faith that you and I are saved. And so God blesses us in spite of our past. But also the text uh, appears to teach us that God blesses us despite our procrastination. Because the truth is, you and I didn't come the first time God called us. And it's right there in the text because I told you as we reread it in the first A clause, it says, now the Lord had said. The first verb in chapter 12 suggests that God was patient with Abraham as he procrastinated in responding to God's call. The text says God had past tense. Spoken to Abram, suggesting that Abram did not immediately follow God, but procrastinated as he began to listen and obey God's voice. And how many of us would be willing to admit that we didn't always come to God on the first call? In fact, we can't even count the many times that God sent somebody in our lives trying to tell us to turn around and receive God and to receive Christ in our life. I can't imagine how many times that I literally rejected the opportunity to be saved because I was caught up in myself trying to live a world, uh, uh, trying to live my own world. But I'm so glad that his grace was patient enough through my procrastination. Because many of my friends and many of the people that I grew up with died when I was young and I could have been one of those. I, I escaped bullets, I escaped death. And that says to me, God was gracious unto me. So I don't take his grace for granted, my brothers and sisters. I know that I was a procrastinator. In fact, had it not been for his grace, I wouldn't have been saved when I got saved. I wasn't looking for Christ, but thank God he was looking for me. I wasn't trying to be saved. I was enjoying sin. How many of you all know when you was out there, you enjoyed sin? Come on, I know you've been saved for a while, but don't act like you didn't enjoy it. If you didn't enjoy it, you wouldn't have kept on doing it. In fact, we enjoyed it, but thank God that although we thought we were living, we didn't understand what life was until we met Christ. And God was gracious to us despite our procrastination. How many times have your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your grandfather, your grandmother told you to get right? How many times has you heard in the past where a preacher or Sunday school teacher when you were coming up telling you to get right? How many people came across your path trying to lead you down a path and you rejected it? God has been good to us despite our procrastination. I don't know how many people he sent to me. And I ignored them intentionally because I wasn't ready to change. But I'm so glad that his... Blessings were not hindered by my past, but neither were they hindered by my procrastination. The Bible says God had spoken, which means he has spoken to Abram. And sometimes God has to speak to us in multiple ways before we hear him. It's kind of like your children. You might have four or five children, and sometimes you got to discipline them differently because all of them don't learn the same. 
Some of them you can just look at it and they get right. <laughs> Amen. Some of them you might be able to have to sit down and talk to and they'll get right. Sometimes you got one that you may have to, you know, put them on some type of punishment. But then there's one that you got to just deal with. I confess, I was at one. <laughs> but, but I understood that despite I may have been the one that had to be dealt with, the dealing was out of love. And I shared with my children years ago when they were coming up, I said, oh, I love all of you equally, but I love you differently. Not that my love is different for each one, but because I understand each person's personality. I got to love them differently, although I love them equally. And I believe God does the same thing with us. All of us come from different backgrounds and different cultures. And sometimes we wonder, why does God do this person like this and do, that do me like that? Well, God loves us equally, but he loves us differently because some of us have to go through certain things before we get it right. Some folk learn the first time, but some of us it takes 150. Mine was 151. Seriously, God has to deal with us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And whatever he does, the Bible says in, in, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And so discipline comes in many forms, but whatever discipline is necessary for us to look up, sometimes God has to go to the uh, 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 extreme measure of knocking some of us down so that the only way we can look is up. But thank God that his grace it's sufficient to the point to where he does not allow our procrastination to, to, to doom ourselves and to destroy ourselves, but he puts us in a position where we have to feel compelled to come to him. That's love. Because he could have wiped you out. That's love because he could have cut you off. That's love because he could have just said, I'm done with you. But by his grace, he kept on until you said, I confess. He kept on until you said, I believe. He kept on until you said, Lord, save me. Anybody know that God's grace just kept on coming to your house, knocking on the door of your heart until you opened up and said, Lord, come in? I'm so glad his blessings were not hindered by our past or our procrastination. The blessings of Abraham were in spite of his unworthiness. But then watch this. God didn't just bless Abraham in spite of, I said there was one or two things I gained from this text. God blessed Abraham also because of. My point is that he didn't initially bless Abraham in, because of, because it was in spite or despite Abraham that God chose to bless him. He wasn't worthy. But once Abraham became I became obedient to the voice of God. God also added blessings and benefits because of. It's right there in the text. Notice what he said. He says, get out from your uh, country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. That is, that I will benefit you. I will favor you. So when God says, I will bless you to Abraham, he says, I will bless you. I will favor you. And I will benefit you. That is, I'm making you, I'm distinguishing you from everybody else in the world. And I'm going to begin with you, a nation of people, a community of people that will be saved and distinguished by their faith. And he says, and I will make your name great. And not only will I benefit and favor you, he says, and you shall be a blessing, which means you shall favor others and be a conduit of God's blessings. So God blessed Abraham, yes, in spite of, but God also blessed Abraham because of. Abraham was blessed first and foremost because of his faith. God blessed him because of faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 and 1 that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You got to understand, my brothers and sisters, that when God spoke to Abram, he could only see by faith what God had promised. And so by faith, he began to trust God. And so many of us 
miss our opportunities to receive from God because we have this mindset, if we can't understand it, we can't follow it. But I'll stop by to tell you, if you can't see it, then you've got to operate by faith. God didn't want you to see it with your physical eyes. Everything cannot be understood logically. Everything cannot be grasped by reason. Sometimes you got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. And I'm convinced a whole lot of Christians live under the curse, not because they're cursed, but because they're afraid to take a risk and walk by faith. Because if it does, well, let me say this, God's will is nonsense to most of us. Or let me say it like this, his will is not nonsense, but his ways are. He says, my ways in Isaiah 55, my ways are not like your ways. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. So when we come to the point where we figure that we've got to be able to figure him out, we'll never be able to figure him out because he doesn't think like us. We'll never be able to understand him by way of reason and logic because his, his thoughts are so high that when he thinks, it doesn't make sense to us. And that's why somebody says, uh, uh, they often say that, that, that when God speaks, it's nonsense to the human mind. But it might be nonsense to the human mind, but it, not, it should not be nonsense to the spiritual minded. And so Abraham was blessed because of his faith. Somebody said, I think it was uh, Jasper Williams, said that when he broke faith down, he says that faith is uh, following, he says faith is, is uh, literally following God, and he broke it down in such a way, he says, uh, and I'm trying to remember how he put it, because he talks about how faith is one of those things that we have to learn how to walk, put in all of our faith in him. And that is that we simply come to a point where we don't trust ourselves, we trust God. Kind of like grace, God's redemption at Christ's expense, you know. And so uh, we follow God. We trust him, even as somebody said, when we can't trace him. And so my brothers and sisters, God blessed Abraham because of his faith. Abraham, watch this. Abraham was willing to take a risk of what, uh, uh, Abraham was willing to pos uh, take a risk with what he possessed based on what God had promised. Because the Bible says Abraham was somewhat wealthy. But to follow God meant that he had to take a risk of losing what he possessed based upon what God had promised. And so often we miss the privilege of being able to receive the blessings of God because whatever little we have in our possessions, too often we're afraid to let go of it based on the promise of God. The Bible tells us in Malachi 3 and 10, it says when it talks about tithes and offerings, it says, that bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. And he says, and prove me now here with said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven. Somebody said every house has more windows than doors. God promises to open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there won't be room enough to receive. But if you've got a little bit and you're trying to hold on to it, if you're trying to hold on to your possession, you miss the promise. And so often we learn to not give in or to not give up because we're afraid of losing. And I shared one time in a sermon, no risk, no reward. You can't lose what you don't own. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything we have belongs to God. You and I are simply stewards over everything. And so to take a risk with what belongs to God is what God requires of us because it's not ours. And I would rather stand before one, God one day saying, I lost everything trying to do your will than to say I held on to this little bit by not doing your will. Because when you go to Matthew, the 22nd chapter, and you talk about the guy with the talents, the Bible said God reprimanded the man who put the uh, gift in the ground. He blessed the ones that took a risk. And the one who took a risk doubled it. I start by to tell you, if God tells you to take a risk, it's not based upon whether it's going to grow based on what you've done. It's going to grow based upon what God has promised. The risk is us believing God and stepping out on faith. Abraham was willing to risk what he possessed for what God had promised. Hebrews 11 and 6 said, without faith it is impossible to please him. Why? Because he who comes to God must first believe he is. Whatever God puts in your spirit, whatever God tells us to do as a believer, we got to believe he's God. 
That means he's bigger than every situation, bigger than every circumstance, bigger than every problem, bigger than what you could lose. You got to believe he's God. And then you got to believe he's willing to reward you if you follow him. And I don't know about you, but I've learned by experience that when I trust God, when I follow him and when I'm obedient to his will, he never comes short of his promise. And I wish I had somebody in the house that could testify to the fact that I knew it was risky, but when I tried him, he came forward. And he proved himself to be the God that he had promised to be. And it may not have happened in the same day or week that I expected, but how many know that when you wait on the Lord and be of good courage, that is to say, I'm not going to fret, I'm not going to fear, I'm not going to become weary and anxious. Whenever God shows up, I'll just be there waiting because I know one thing, he's never short of his word. Without faith, it's impossible. James 2 and 17 says, faith without works is dead. To say you have faith and don't put it to practice. To say you have faith and never start walking by faith. To say you have faith and never take what God has put in your possession and plant it with the risk of losing it. The Bible says it's dead faith. God expects us to trust him. God expects us to believe him. And God expects us to follow him. Abraham was blessed because of his faith, but finally Abraham was blessed because of his favor, because of God's favor. Abraham became the initial conduit for the blessings of God upon humanity. Remember what God says. God says, in other words, not only will I bless you, he said, but I will bless you and I will bless your family. In other words, you now become the initial conduit and the way for the whole world to be saved. Not because your name is Abraham, not because you're a Jew, not because you're a Hebrew, but because of faith. And the Old Testament always leads up to the New Testament, and the New Testament always looks back to the Old Testament. And what God was teaching us through this text is that Abraham was saying, in essence, we're not saved by works, although the law had not yet been. He was saying the law will come, but you're not going to get saved by being good. You're going to be good because you got saved. And so what the Bible teaches us is that by faith, all the nation, he's, when he says all of the families of the world will be blessed, he's not saying everybody's just going to be automatically blessed. He's saying everybody that puts their faith in me, as you did, Abraham, will be blessed and will be favored. And so Abraham was blessed because of his faith, but he was also blessed because of God's favor because the text tells us in the word blessed, it means God's benefits and God's favor. How many of you are really want to be a favored child of God? You know, Joseph in, in Genesis 37 was a type of Christ who was a favored child. The Bible said that he had a colorful robe and God had favored him. And I start by to tell you that if you are a child of God, you are a favorite of God. You say, well, how can I be a favorite of God when God's got so many children? All of us who are in Christ are favored by God. That is to say, God has blessed us and you got to start coming to the realization you're not just a child. You're not just a servant. You're not just a man. You're not just a woman. You are a favor and you ought to walk like a favored child. You ought to talk like a favored child. You ought to try to live. Like, I'm not talking about being arrogant, but I'm saying you ought to recognize that no matter what comes across your path, you are a favored child. What does that mean? That means there are benefits above and beyond my uh, responsibilities that God has placed in my life. There are some benefits that God has given me simply because I'm called by his name. There are some things that I have that the rest of the world don't have. Jesus says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have have come to give you life and life more abundantly. I thank God for my benefits. In other words, I ain't working for it. God just gave me a benefit package that's above and beyond my worthiness. But somebody in the house ought to shout on that because when you think about the benefits, oh yeah, I'm grateful for the salvation. I'm glad that one day I'm going to heaven. I'm glad that one day sin will be gone. But I stopped by to tell you a benefit it's a house I don't deserve to live in. It's health and strength I don't deserve. The ability to stand up in the morning. There are some benefits. Peace of mind. Despite all that I go through. Is a benefit. Joy. In my heart. When everything is falling apart. That's a benefit. The ability to get up in the morning. knowing that Not knowing what the day will bring. 
but not worried about anything. That's a benefit. Bill collector's knocking on my door, but I'm standing on the promises of God that somehow, some way, God will make a way. That's a benefit. Somebody say, how are you going to stand on a benefit? Well, it's not just a benefit. The benefit came from the cross over 2,000 years ago on an old rugged cross, won by the name of Christ. They hung him high. They stressed him wide. He died for you, and he died for me. But early on Sunday morning, the Bible said he rose, and that became a benefit. How is that a benefit? Because he rose, I can rise again. Yes, one day, I'll be in the great resurrection, but I can rise above depression. I can rise above sickness. I can rise above trials. I can rise above troubles. Why? Because that's my benefit. Not only can I rise above it, I can pass it on to my children and my children's children. I can teach them you are a favorite child. It doesn't make you better than everybody. It just means God has been better to you than everybody. Simply said, because you're my child. In fact, I take me back to when I lived on Indian Trail. And when I lived out there, we had a basketball court in the backyard. And many of the kids would come back there and play ball. And sometimes in the neighborhood, they would go wrong. But when my child was involved, I didn't discipline all of them. I may have spoke to them, but I disciplined my child. Why? Because my child is a favorite child. I may have loved all of them, but I had a different kind of love for my own child. I knew the path that they were taking, but I didn't want my child to take that path. That's a benefit, so whatever I poured into my children, I was trying to tell them, you're not the same as everybody else in the neighborhood. If they're saved, yes, we're the same, but if they're not saved, you're you a favored child. You gotta act like you're favored. You gotta learn how to live like you're favored. Christ died and gave his life as a living sacrifice and God called Abram and changed his name to Abraham so that he would become a father of all nations who will come to him by faith and as a result of coming to him by faith you become favored in his presence and it doesn't mean that you won't go through anything it just means that whatever you go through you'll get through even if you get through it by death because death is not something that hurts us for me to live as Christ, talk to me somebody, and to die is not a loss, it's a gain. I'm living for that day when I can cross over on the other side. I'm living for that day when I can see him face to face. I'm living for that day when I could bow before his throne and say thank you for how I got over. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your long sufferings. Anybody know God has been working with you longer than you deserve? But I want to be able to say thank you that you never gave up on me. The blessings of Abraham are the blessings of all those who come by faith. And if you are a child of God, you are a blessed child. What does that mean? You're, you have benefits that nobody else has but the children of God and your favor. That means you're distinguished from everybody else. And you have the privilege of going to the throne of God at any time and knowing that when you pray, God hears you and answers your prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word today. We give you all the praise, honor, and the glory for it. And we thank you, God, that we have learned through this text that you have taught us, God, that we are men and women who were undeserving and unworthy, but you saved us in spite of. You called us in spite of our unworthiness, but then you favored us because of. You taught us to walk by faith. You taught us to live by favor. So God, I pray that your word will be settled in the hearts of this your people. Wherever it's heard, it might grip the heart of men and women, boys and girls, and transform them and conform them into the very image of Christ. There might be somebody here today, God, that doesn't have a church home, may not.
we say may not be in a position where they supposed to be as your children. Whatever happens, God, I pray that your will be done. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to extend an invitation as everyone stands this morning. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you'd like to do so today. I'm going to ask that you would come. I want to rededicate your life. So I know I'm a child of God, but I haven't been receiving the favor because I've been outside of his will. But God says if you just simply come back like the prodigal son, he stands with open arms to restore you to that place and that proper place that you belong. You might be here today and you're already saved, but you just don't have a church home. And God is saying this is where I want to plant you, where you can grow, where you can develop, where you can mature spiritually, and where you become all that I would ordained you to be. If that's you today, would you come? As the choir leads us in a song of invitation, you might need somebody to pray with you, pray for you. Become one of God's children. Become one of Abraham's seed. If that's you today. If you're here today, there's no better time than now than to make that decision. If you don't have a church home, you need somebody to pray with you want to restore your relationship with Christ. I come to Christ for the first time. Will you come today? Will you, will you take that walk of faith, that leap of faith? Let it rise. If you don't have a church home, if you want to rededicate your life, need somebody to pray with you, stand in agreement with you. Come on, everybody, let's sing that song today together as we prepare to leave. Let everybody say, let it rise. Come on, take it up a notch. Come on, let's worship on our way out. Let it. Let I may want the glory of the Lord to rise above it. Yes. All you got to pray it, do is pray it and believe it. Let it. All right. Yes. Come on, one more time. Take it up a notch, everybody. Come on, put your hands together. Let's worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Yes. Let them rise among us. Those who are happy in Christ ought to dance before his presence and praise him. Yeah, dance before him. David dance. All of us ought to praise him. Yes, Lord. Let it. I don't know about you, but I want it to rise in my life. praise in this house as we prepare to go to our Sunday school classes, our new member orientation classes, our life application classes. Uh, there's a quick announcement that we're going to make and we're going on our way up as we prepare to give our tithes and our offerings. 
I want to ask that you would give cheerfully and generously as God has blessed you and ask that you would be faithful because all that we do here at First Baptist Church is through your giving. So we need every person to be faithful. If God has been faithful to you, be faithful unto him. Quickly, Miss Barbara. training um, on that day and it's a pre I'm sorry it's a presentation of the Kentucky Baptist Convention the facilitator is going to be uh, Dr. Todd Gray and um, come out we want you to uh, uh, learn to share the good news and learn th this presentation has to do with learning 20 ways you can grow in personal evangelism and the uh, training is going to start at 10 and will last until 12. The doors will open at 9.30 for a registration and continental uh, breakfast. And the, the name of the training is Growing in Personal Evangelism. And we don't want to forget the, the youth because our youth are the church of the future. Amen. And so we want them not to be uh, like a lot of us. We are scared to, to let others know about Jesus Christ and what he's done in our own lives. And so that training is going to be led by uh, our brother Jerome Barber, and uh, it's going to help the youth to learn how to share the gospel, share their testimony, learn about lifestyle evangelism, and pray and recognize open doors and answer some common questions about spirituality, uh, Christianity. And so while the training for the adults is going on, the training for the youth will be going on at the same time. Amen. And uh, this is for everybody, no matter whether or not you think, I've got this mastered. Now, you, we can always learn something. We all can learn something. And I'm speaking to each one of you that are sitting there this morning. And then last, uh, we do need some help for the uh, Gaslight Festival booth. I can't remember how many years we've been doing this, but we also need help for that. And we really, I'm looking at men right now, we really need men to get out there on Waterson Trail, pray for people, let them know about Christ, because there are a lot of men that come through there. And so we really need men to stand up. Thank you. Amen. And whether we know it or not, the greatest mission of the church is evangelism, reaching lost souls. So I'm encouraging you and everyone to take uh, heed to what has been stated. Govern yourselves accordingly as we prepare to take up the offering. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for today's worship experience. We give you praise, God, for all that has transpired. May it be all for your glory, but for our good and for the good of others. We also pray, God, you would bless now the offering that will be taken up in your name sanctify it, glorify yourself in and through it, multiply it, God, to meet the needs and demands of our local congregation and for what you've called us to do. We also pray, God, you bless every home and favor every home that is obedient to your word and strives to do all that you've called us to do. Forgive us of our sins and be with us as we go from this place to our classes and to our various destinations. Keep us safe and in your care unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever. Let the believing heart say, Amen. Find the direction of our ushers. I want to ask that you would stand and that you would give generously and that you would give cheerfully. Amen. 